Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. A series of study from the Holy Scriptures based on the book of Revelation by Mark Finley. Join us as we follow the vital topics that will be presented on this study, understanding God's messages and warnings on this last days of Earth's history. Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. What does the future hold? Where can we find certainty in a world of uncertainty? The Book of Revelation provides hopeful answers for today, tomorrow, and forever. Join Mark Finley, author and world-renowned speaker, on a journey into the future with Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. The Book of Revelation is a book of hope. It's a book that provides light in the darkness of our world. It's a book that provides certainty at a time of uncertainty. It's a book that provides assurance for the future. In our, this presentation, we're focusing on the judgment, Revelation's final judgment. And you'll discover that the judgment is really good news and not bad news at all. Let's pray as we go into our topic. Father in heaven, thank you for the book of Revelation that casts light on the road ahead. Thank you that judgment in Revelation is good news for the people of God and not bad news. Guide us in our study and make this truth plain to us, for we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Our topic is Revelation's final judgment. In the book of Revelation, chapter 14 and verse seven, a message to go to the end of the earth is carried by three angels in mid-heaven. That first angel says, fear God, that's not be afraid of God, but that's reverence or respect God. In awe, obey him. Give glory to him in everything you do, whether you eat or drink, for the hour of his judgment has come. Now notice what our text says. Our text does not say the hour of God's judgment will come. It does not give us a future tense for that judgment. It rather focuses on a present tense judgment. The text says that the sands in the hourglass of time are running out, that the hour of God's judgment has come. This is no longer business as usual no longer pleasures as usual, but rather an urgent end time message calling men and women everywhere to be prepared to be ready for the coming of Christ. When we look at the book of Revelation, we find in the Old Testament a companion book. That companion book is the book of Daniel. And Daniel provides for us the keys to unlock the book of Revelation. Let's go and notice the comparison between these two books. Revelation describes details about the judgment. Daniel predicts the when and where of the judgment. So do you see the difference? Revelation gives you the broad strokes. Revelation speaks of this judgment at end time. It gives you the specifics of that judgment. It doesn't talk about the where of the judgment very much, some, and it certainly does not talk about the when of the judgment. Revelation 14, 7 says the hour of God's judgment has come, but it doesn't tell us when that judgment begins. Revelation 22, verse 12 points out that there is a judgment before the coming of Jesus. It says, my reward is with me, speaking of Jesus, to give every one according to his work. So judgment is all through the book of Revelation. If Jesus is coming to give out the rewards, then certainly there must be a judgment previous to his return to determine who receives what reward when he comes. Judgment is all through the book of Revelation. Jesus talks about judgment in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels then he will reward each according to his works. So when Jesus comes, he comes to give out the rewards. But there must be a judgment previous to his coming to determine who receives what reward when he comes. Revelation chapter 20 verse 12 points out again the idea of judgment. 
And I saw the dead, small and great. Standing before God, the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The scripture goes on. And the dead were judged, notice what it says, the dead were judged, according to their works, by the things that were written in the books. So scripture teaches, and particularly the book of Revelation, that all humanity is moving to one glorious climactic event, the second coming of Christ. It, te it teaches that before Jesus comes, the entire world will face judgment to determine who receives what reward when Christ comes. Now that really leads us to a question. Why would God have a judgment? Doesn't God already know our hearts? Doesn't God already understand the issues of our life? Doesn't God know everything? Why would he need a judgment? The judgment is not primarily for God. There is a great controversy in the universe. Lucifer, a fallen angel, a being of dazzling brightness, has made some charges against the government of God. In fact, Lucifer said that God was unfair and unjust. The rebellion in heaven introduced a question into the universe about God's character, about his fairness, about his integrity. So God is on trial before the universe. The Bible says in Revelation 14, seven, the hour of his judgment has come. So God is on trial before the universe. His character has been maligned by Satan. It has been defamed by a fallen angel. And Lucifer said, God is unfair, God is unjust. What does the judgment reveal? The judgment reveals the goodness of God, the greatness of God. You know, even in this life, people say, this is not fair, this is unjust. Look what happened to me. It's not fair that a child suffers of AIDS because of what their parents have done. It's not fair that children are born into poverty. It is not fair that a shooter enters into a church and kills innocent people. It is not fair that a wife is beaten by her drunken husband. Life is not fair. It's very true. Life is not fair, but yet, in the final judgment, God will set all things right. And he will reveal that in the midst of the unfairness of life, in the midst of the heartache of life, in the midst of the disappointment of life, he was there. So that's what the judgment is all about. It's about this cosmic conflict between good and evil. It's about this struggle between Christ and Satan. And the judgment reveals the justice, the righteousness, and the goodness of God. The major theme of Revelation is this conflict between Christ and Satan. The major theme of Revelation is about the goodness of God, the greatness of God. And in Revelation, you remember those four words that are the theme of the book of Revelation? Jesus wins and Satan loses. The theme of Revelation is Christ the victorious lamb, Christ the triumphant king who triumphs over the principalities and powers of hell. His name will be exalted. His plan will be exalted. His people will triumph and he will be exonerated before the whole universe. Now God reveals in the judgment that he's done everything he can to save every human being. And Satan has done everything he can to destroy. So the judgment reveals that God's love has reached out to every single human being on a planet called Earth. Now where does this judgment take place? The book of Revelation shares the details of the judgment. The book of Daniel reveals this cosmic judgment occurring in the far reaches of the universe, in the inner courts of heaven, in the sanctuary above. Daniel chapter seven, verse nine and 10 says, I watched till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days, who's that the father, was seated. His garment was white as snow. Thrones are put in place. 
movable thrones are established in that most holy place of heaven's sanctuary. Talking about the Father, it says the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, its wheels as a burning fire. A thousand thousands ministered to him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. Imagine this scene. Let your mind grasp it. 10,000 times 10,000 gather in heaven's courts. The whole universe is there present at this universal cosmic judgment. God is on trial and God reveals in that test before the whole universe that he's done everything he can to save every human being. God reveals that there's nothing more that he could do to save human beings. God's love is on display. God's character is on trial. And in the judgment, the whole universe gathers. Now when does this judgment take place? Could it be? that we are living in the judgment hour? Could it be that heaven's court has gathered? Could it be that the books are opened and the court is set? If that is true, if Revelation and Daniel combine these two great prophetic books, teach us that we're living in the judgment hour, then that drives us to our needs. It drives us to faith in Christ and to commit ourselves totally to him. The Bible talks about the fact that before Jesus comes, and we've mentioned it, that he would, when he comes, he'd give out his reward. So before he comes, there must be this universal judgment. In Daniel chapter eight, verse 14, we have the timing of that judgment. Daniel seven reveals the judgment would take place in heaven. Daniel seven doesn't say anything about the timing of the judgment. Daniel eight fourteen describes the timing of that judgment. Unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Now notice, there's a time period and there is an event. The time period, unto 2,300 days, the event, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. But you say, that seems rather strange. What is this cleansing of the sanctuary? What does the cleansing of the sanctuary mean? What is the cleansing of the sanctuary all about? How does that relate to the judgment? And what about these 2,300 days? 2,300 days from Daniel's time certainly wouldn't take us down to the time of the end. So let's try to explore the answer to some of those questions. First, what does the cleansing of the sanctuary mean? In Exodus chapter 25, verse eight, the Bible takes us back to the building of a sanctuary in the wilderness. It says, let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. There was an earthly sanctuary built in Old Testament times. That earthly sanctuary was a scale model of the great sanctuary in heaven. The earthly sanctuary revealed the varying phases of the plan of salvation. In the earthly sanctuary, we are able to understand Jesus' work as sacrifice, Jesus' work as priest, and also the final judgment. So when the Bible says, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, it's necessary to understand the working of the Old Testament sanctuary and what cleansing meant there, so we will understand this cleansing of the sanctuary or this judgment at end time. When you come to the sanctuary in the Old Testament, it was really divided into three parts. There was an outer court. It was to that outer court that sinners brought their sacrifices. Once the sacrifice was slain in the outer court, the priest entered into the holy place of the sanctuary and sprinkled the blood before the veil. Behind that veil was the most holy place where the law of God was enshrined. Let's walk through that sanctuary. Let's suppose that here's a sinner. This sinner has gotten an argument. This sinner has become uh, one who has stolen from a friend. This sinner has become one who's been critical in the camp. 
The Holy Spirit convicts him. Recognizing his sin, he must come with an offering. The offering could be a lamb without spot or blemish. Rulers might bring a bullock. Poor people might bring a grain offering. So, but an offering must be brought. You might say grain offering, no blood. Well, there was a morning and evening sacrifice in which blood was shed, shed in the sanctuary for people that were too poor to have an animal sacrifice. You see, the sanctuary system provided salvation for all humanity. And so the lamb was brought by the sinner. The sinner places his hands over the head of the lamb and then the sinner's guilt as he confessed his sin or her, the sin was symbolically transferred to the perfect lamb. So the person, for example, has stolen something. Of course, he must return that which he's stolen, but the sinner places his hands over the head of the lamb, says, dear Jesus, I've stolen. Dear Jesus, I've been selfish. Dear Jesus, I've been greedy. Dear Jesus, forgive me, O Father. Sin is transferred via guilt to that lamb. And as it is, the lamb then must be slain, but the sinner slays the lamb. Sin is so bad that it causes the death of its victim. Our sin is so bad that it causes the death of Jesus Christ. When we come with the burden of sin, when we come with the guilt of sin, when we come with the shame of sin, when we come condemned and we confess our sins, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do what? To do what, everybody? To forgive our sins. Just as the sinner came with a burden, confessed their sin over the head of the lamb, and the guilt was transferred to the lamb, so our guilt is transferred transferred to our lamb, Jesus. The priest then would take the blood of that sacrifice. Some of the sacrifice would be burned at the altar in the court. The priest would wash his hands, take the blood into the holy place, sprinkle that blood before the veil. So all year, sin is being transferred into the sanctuary. The sinner confesses his sin over the head of the lamb. The guilt is transferred to the lamb. The blood is shed. The record of the sin is in the blood. The blood is, goes into the sanctuary and it's sprinkled before the veil, before the law of God in that most holy place. It's sprinkled before the veil between the holy and the most holy. Sin is transferred into the sanctuary, representing that Jesus offers the merits of his blood in heaven on our behalf. We come burdened, we come filled with guilt and shame. We confess our sin, and as we do, it's transferred through the cross and by the blood, Jesus, our our high priest takes it to the heavenly sanctuary and he says before the universe, this man, this woman, this child is one of mine. Their sins are forgiven and he intercedes for us there. He intercedes for us before that law that was broken. He intercedes for us there in heaven before the very throne of the living God. Once a year in the Jewish sanctuary, there was something called the Day of Atonement. All of Israel gathered around the camp. It was a day of judgment. It was the day of the cleansing of the sanctuary. All year, sin had been transferred in. But now, sin would be taken from the sanctuary. Two goats would be chosen. One was called the Lord's goat, the other the scapegoat. The Lord's goat and the scapegoat. We find there in that service, the service known as the cleansing of the sanctuary. Blood was shed of the one goat. No guilt, no shame, no condemnation could be atoned for without the blood of Christ. The high priest brought that blood now once a year, not simply into the holy place, but into the most holy place, sprinkled it before the very throne of God, then left the sanctuary and put all the guilt, all the shame on that scapegoat Satan that would forever 
be separated from the people of God. Now when the high priest entered the most holy place in this special work on the day of atonement, this special work called the cleansing of the sanctuary, all of Israel gathered around. They opened their hearts. They prayed. They sought God. So what was the cleansing of the sanctuary in ancient Israel? It was a day of judgment because any Israelite that did not confess their sin would be cut off from Israel. Every Israelite had to examine their heart. Every Israelite had to be sure that their life was right with God. Every Israelite had to fall on their knees in repentance. This was the day of judgment. This was the day of atonement. This was Yom Kippur. This was indeed a day of the cleansing of the sanctuary. So in the sanctuary services, there were really two services. There was the daily service. Lambs are slain. Blood is transferred from the sinner through the blood, or sin is transferred rather from the sinner to the lamb through the blood into the sanctuary once a year. In the yearly service, the high priest enters the most holy place, cleansing of the sanctuary. Sin then is brought from the sanctuary, placed on the origin of evil, the scapegoat, who's separated from God's people forever. One day, Satan, the one who's responsible for sin, will take the consequences of sin and be destroyed forever and ever and ever, just like that scapegoat was brought out into the wilderness. The Bible says, Daniel 8, verse 14, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary be cleansed. What is the cleansing of the sanctuary? At the end of time, it is the final judgment that condemns Satan and condemns sin forever and ever. The Day of Atonement was an illustration of God's judgment in the heavenly sanctuary that'll occur just before Jesus comes again. But you say, wait a minute, the 2300 days, 2300 literal days is a little more than six years. That doesn't take us down to the end of time. And doesn't the angel Gabriel in Daniel chapter eight say to Daniel, Daniel, I'll help you to understand the vision. It'll apply to the time of the end. He does, Daniel eight verse 16, Daniel eight verse 27. The vision would apply to the time of the end. What then is the sense of this 2300 days? These are prophetic symbols. Let's look at them. What's the meaning of the 2300 days? This is one of the most amazing. This is one of the most incredible. This is one of the most remarkable prophecies in all the Bible because it shares the exact date that Christ would be baptized. It shares the exact date Christ would be crucified. It shares the exact date that the gospel would go from the Jews, including the Jews, of course, to the Gentiles and it shares when God's judgment would begin at end time. It is a remarkable prophecy. It's mathematically precise. It's minutely accurate. Let's journey together. The angel Gabriel in Daniel 8, verse 16 and 17 says, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. What was Gabriel's task? To make Daniel understand the vision. At the end of chapter eight in verse 27 and onward, Daniel faints and he did, does not understand the vision. The scripture says, so when he came near where I stood, and when he came near I was afraid, fell on my face, but he said to me, understand son of man, for the vision refers, what does the vision refer to everybody? The time of the end. So the vision of the 2300 days, the vision of the cleansing of the sanctuary does not apply to Daniel's time. What time does it apply to again? The time of the end. It would take us down to end time. Now, 2300 literal days does not take us down to end time. Ezekiel was a contemporary of Daniel, and Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 4, verse 6, I have laid on you a day for each year. In Bible prophecy, one prophetic day represents one literal year. If the Bible gives us the starting point for this 2300 days or 2300 what everybody, years, then we can easily calculate the ending point. Now somebody says, how do you know 
the day year principle applies. How do you know that one prophetic day equals one literal year in this prophecy that says unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed? How do you know the day year principle applies? Two ways, first, the angel Gabriel doesn't make mistakes. And he says the prophecy would take us down to the time of the end. Obviously, 2,300 days from Daniel's time would just take you down uh, a few years, not even to the days immediately in Persia that overcame Babylon. So really, when you begin to look at this whole prophecy, you begin to understand that 2,300 days doesn't even take you out of the Persian period. Secondly, have you ever heard the saying, if the shoe fits, what is it? If the shoe fits, you're right. If the shoe fits, wear it. When you apply the day year principle, one prophetic day equaling a literal year, when you apply that principle, everything in the prophecy fits minutely. Everything in the prophecy fits exactly. We see the exact time of Christ coming in his baptism, the exact time of the crucifixion of Christ, the exact time the gospel would go to the Gentiles. So the angel Gabriel comes back and he explains this prophecy to Daniel. He says, Daniel, I've come to give you understanding of the vision. Daniel 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and your city. You see the word determined there? It's an interesting Hebrew word. The Old Testament, of course, is written in Hebrew, and it's the word chatuk, and it means cut off. Seventy weeks are cut off from what? The 2,300 days or the 2,300 years. So 70 weeks are cut off. Who are they cut off for? for your city and your people. So Daniel's city was Jerusalem, Daniel's people the Jews. Of the 2300 years, 70 weeks are cut off from that period. They are the first part of that period. Notice how it's put, 70 weeks are determined, are cut off from the 2300 years for your people, that is the Jews, and your holy city, that is Jerusalem. So if you look at 70 prophetic weeks and you need to figure out how many days are in those prophetic weeks so you can figure out how many years that is, how many days in a week? How many days in a week? I knew this was a good group. How many days in a week? Seven. All right. So if I've got seven days in a week and I want to figure out how many days in 70 prophetic weeks, that's 490 days. Seven times zero is zero. Seven times seven is 49. 490 prophetic days equal what? If one prophetic day equals a year, it's 490 years. So you have a 2300 year prophecy and the first part of that prophecy, 70 weeks, 490 days or 490 literal years is cut off for that. Ezekiel 4 verse 6, I've laid on you each day for a what? Year. So 490 symbolic days equal 490 literal years. The, that part relates to Daniel's people. Along this timeline, we're gonna see the exact day for the exact time for the baptism of Christ, the exact time for the crucifixion of Christ, the exact time the gospel will go to the Gentiles. We're gonna to discover too, the time for heaven's cleansing of the sanctuary, the time for earth's final judgment, the time of a amazing prophecy that would go to the ends of the earth to prepare people for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when does this prophecy start? Unless we can figure out when these 490 years start, we won't be able at all to discover the events along the timeline. We have a clear text in Daniel 9, verse 25. Know therefore and understand. What does the Bible say? It says what? Know and what else? Know and understand. When the angel Gabriel, through the inspiration of God, says know it and understand it. You think it's important to know it? You think it's important to understand it? What does the Bible say? Know therefore and understand. From the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem. So in Daniel's day, Babylon had overthrown, had been overthrown by Medo-Persia. 
When would this command go forth to restore and build Jerusalem? Jerusalem was in ruins. The Babylonians had destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar came down in three attacks and overthrew that city. Daniel's city was in ruins. Daniel's people were in captivity. The Persians overthrew the Babylonians. And the Persian king, Artaxerxes, would sign a decree allowing the Israelites to go back and worship. If we can discover when that decree took place, remember our text, know therefore and understand from the decree to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. So if we can understand when that decree went forth, then we will be able to know when the prophecy begins. The angel said, know it, understand it from the going forth of the decree to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. Who's Messiah the Prince? Jesus Christ. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. What's seven and 62 weeks? 69 weeks. So from the day that the command goes forth to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah shall be 69 prophetic weeks. How much are 69 prophetic weeks? Seven times nine are 63. Seven times six are 42. Carry my six and that's 48. That's 483 years. So of the 490 years that relate to the Jews, the first 483 of these years take you from the decree to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah. When did that decree go forth? No question about it. Ezra tells us in Ezra, seventh chapter, he says that the decree went forth in the year of Artaxerxes and it pinpoints the very exact year, 457 BC. So here's what scripture teaches. From 457 BC, 483 years forward on the timeline will take you to the coming of the Messiah. There are two parts to the prophecy. The first 70 weeks, 490 years. The last 1810 years, 490 and 1810, equal 2300 prophetic days or literal years. The entire prophecy would begin when, everybody? When the angel said, no, therefore and understand from the command to restore and build Jerusalem until what? Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks or 69 prophetic weeks. 69 prophetic weeks or 483 years. So let's suppose I'm back here on the timeline. The decree goes forth in 457. And I've got to go forward on that timeline 483 years until I come to Messiah, the Prince. Now what does the word Messiah mean? The word Messiah means the anointed one. When was Jesus anointed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism? So this prophecy then should take us from 457 BC, it should take us down the timeline 483 years until the baptism of Jesus Christ. When was Christ's baptism? Can we be certain of when that baptism was? If you go 483 years in this timeline, it'll take you to 27 AD. Now somebody says, how do you figure that out? Very simple. Let's suppose that I, were ba I was back at 457 BC. And let's suppose I had to walk forward only 457 years or paces. 457, if I'm only going forward 457, what year would that take me to? You say zero, but there's no zero year. It goes from 1 BC to 1 AD. So 457 forward on the timeline would take me to 1 AD. But I'm not going 457, I'm going how many? 483. I'm going 69 prophetic weeks, 483 prophetic days, or 483 years. Well, I need to go not 457, but I need to go 26 more that takes me exactly to 27 AD. What happened in 27 AD? Luke 3 verse 21. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. What year was this, do we know? Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. So what year is that? 27 AD. 
Christ comes. The decree goes forth in the fall of 457 to rebuild Jerusalem. 483 years later, takes me to the fall of 27 AD. And what happens then? Christ is baptized exactly like the Bible predicted. Jesus is the Messiah who came on time. Now, after his baptism, it says, after the 62 weeks Messiah, the anointed one baptized shall be cut off. What do you think cut off means? What do you think cut off means? It means, of course, crucified. So the Bible predicted that Jesus, after his baptism, would be crucified. And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. What does it mean that Christ will confirm the covenant? You know, I've heard some people say that, uh, oh, this refers to the Antichrist. He's gonna confirm the covenant. He's gonna confirm a covenant with the Jews. Isn't it just like the devil? to take an amazing prophecy on the death of Christ that confirms beyond a shadow of a doubt that Christ is the Messiah and turn around for the Antichrist? In the New Testament, the Antichrist never makes a covenant with anybody. Who is it that makes the covenant? It's Jesus Christ. Now look at the prophecy. The decree would go forth in 457 BC. We go forth 483 years on the timeline. Christ is baptized on time. There are 490 years that relate to the Jews. 483 take you down to AD 27. There are seven years left in the prophecy, or one prophetic week, or seven prophetic days, or seven years. Then the Bible says, verse, Daniel 9, verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Who would confirm that covenant? Jesus Christ would confirm it when he shed his blood on Calvary's cross. In the middle of the week, that's in the middle of those last seven years, he shall, he the Messiah, the one that's gonna confirm the covenant, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So it would be Christ in the middle of that last prophetic week that would shed his blood for all humanity. What would take place then? Look. If you have one prophetic week left down to 27 AD, and if you have something that takes place in the middle of that last prophetic week, what's half seven? What's half seven? You got it. It's not so complicated. Half seven is three and a half. So if 483 years take me to the fall of 27 AD, and I have three and a half more years till the middle of that last prophetic week, Three and a half from the fall of 27, well, three years from the fall of 27 would take me to the fall of 30. But if I have six more months, it takes me to the spring of 31. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, at 33 years old, died exactly in the spring of the year, 31 AD. Amazing prophecy that predicts the exact time of Christ's death. He died on the Passover in the spring of 31 AD. The prophecies of the book of Daniel combined with Revelation are remarkably incredible. Daniel 9 is about Jesus Christ, our Messiah, the Christ that is more than a good man, the Christ that's more than an ethical teacher, the Christ that's more than a moral philosopher, the Christ who would come, he was baptized on time he shed his blood on time he Christ the Passover lamb and that's why Paul said Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us he Matthew chapter 26 verse 28 who would confirm the covenant this is my blood Jesus said in the last supper of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins Christ establishes a new covenant. Men and women are saved by his blood of the new covenant. They are saved through his grace of that new covenant. Men and women in the Old Testament were saved by the Christ that was to come. They were not saved by works. We are saved by the Christ that has come. What's the difference between the Old and New Covenant? In the Old Covenant, our Jewish race said, everything the Lord said we will do we will keep the law in the new covenant Jesus says I have kept the law for you my perfect life can atone for your imperfection come to me and find my grace and my mercy 
This is the blood of the new covenant. But all this was predicted in Daniel chapter nine, that the Messiah would come, that the Messiah would be cut off. He would sacrifice his life exactly in the spring of 31 AD as the Passover lamb for us. Christ was crucified exactly on time. Have you noticed the many passages in the New Testament that speak about the timing of Christ's baptism, the timing of Christ's death? Notice Galatians 4, verse four. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. What's that talking about? Jesus was born on time, Jesus baptized on time, Jesus crucified on time, gospel going to the Gentiles on time. When the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son. Jesus is baptized. Mark 1, verse 15, he says, the time is fulfilled. There's a divine timetable. Jesus is crucified on time. The Bible says in due time, Christ died for the ungodly at the right time. Romans 5, verse 6, all of this predicted in the prophecies of Daniel, all of this predicted hundreds of years in advance. Is it not incredible? Is it not amazing? Is it not mind-boggling? that over 600 years in advance, Daniel predicts in his prophecies the death of Christ. He predicts these events in the life of Christ and the timing of these events. The Bible's no common book and Jesus is no common man. This book is inspired by the living God. Every page speaks of the wisdom of God. Every page speaks of the grace of God. Every speak page speaks of the power of the living God. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Notice what Daniel said, he shall bring sacrifice and offering to cease. He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. When Christ died on the cross, the veil in the temple was rent in two. The lambs were no longer to be sacrificed as Passover lamb because Jesus, our Passover, died for us. Christ was baptized on time. Christ was crucified on time. Christ ascended to heaven on time. Now notice, there'd be three and a half years left in the prophecy. The decree goes forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem in 457. 483 years later, A.D. 27, Christ is baptized on time. Three and a half years after that, in A.D. 31, the cross of Christ, Jesus dies. So here you find Christ baptized right as the Bible said, A.D. 27. Christ crucified exactly as the Bible says, A.D. 31. The, now the, there are three and a half years left in the prophecy of the 490 years that relate to the Jews. And uh, three and a half years from the spring of AD 31 take us down to the spring of, to the fall rather, of AD 34. What happened then? What happened in 34 AD? In 34 AD, exactly on time exactly like the Bible predicted. Stephen gives that amazing speech. He stands there before the Jewish high priest and Jewish leaders and Stephen opens his heart and shares about the Messiah. The high priest is stunned and they begin to see that the Jewish leadership is being charged with the crucifixion of Christ and rejecting Jesus. And as that is taking place among those Jewish high priests, they begin throwing stones to kill Stephen. Three things happens in, in AD 34. Stephen's speech that Christ was the Messiah. The Jewish high priest rips his garments, rejecting Stephen's reasoning that Jesus was the Messiah. The gospel then, from that point forward, includes not only Jews, and it does, most of the early church were Jewish, but it includes now Gentiles. The gospel goes now to the world. By the grace of Christ, Jew and Gentile are becoming Christians. 490 year prophecy. 
that relates to the Jewish people. Every event along the timeline of that prophecy was indeed fulfilled. Daniel 9 verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people, that is the Jews, your holy city, Jerusalem. So part one of the prophecy relates to the Jews. From 457 BC, God gave them mercy, God gave them grace, God gave them salvation, down to AD 34. You see, it's, isn't it fascinating that even after the Jewish nation, through their priests, turned their back on the gospel and on Jesus. Now remember what we said, was not the Jewish people. Many of them accepted the Messiah. It was Jewish leadership, Jewish priests. But even after the crucifixion of Christ, for 33 and, a, a, for rather three and a half years, three and a half years, God reached out in mercy. God reached out in grace. It wasn't until 34 AD that Jesus turned to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, along with the Jews. Isn't God merciful? Isn't God gracious? Isn't God amazingly good? But notice part two. 490 years of the 2300 are determined. Remember they're cut off. Take us down to AD 34. There's 1810 years left. 1810 would more after AD 34 would take us down to the judgment. Take us down to the cleansing of heaven's sanctuary. Take us down to the time when the gospel would go to the ends of the earth and the warning message would go forth, get ready. Christ is about ready to come. If you take AD 34, at 1810, it takes you down to the year 1844. What does that mean? We are living in the judgment hour. It's no longer time as usual. No longer business as usual. Since 1844, God has been sending his warning message to the ends of the earth. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Somebody says, but wait a minute. That's well over 160 some odd years ago. How could we be living in the judgment hour for all that time? Remember, Noah preached for 120 years. Population base was much smaller then than it is now. With God, if you look at the great stream of millenniums of human history, if you look at that great stream of time, 160 some odd years is a small slice when you look at all the years of human history. God gives ample time for all the whole human race. So what's going on now? First, in heaven. Heaven's final judgment is taking place. Thousands times 10,000s are gathered around the throne of God from throughout all the universe. And there, God's character is be, being revealed as righteous and true before the universe. God is showing that he's done everything he could to save every human being. Every person that has died in ages past cases examined meticulously to show God's grace and God's goodness that he could not do anything else to save one human being. And while at that same time that is happening a message is to go to the ends of the earth Daniel 8 verse 14 for 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed then shall the judgment take place God is inviting men and women everywhere to gather around that sanctuary God is inviting men and women everywhere to open their hearts in repentance to be sure that their hearts are right with God since 1844 we have been living in God's judgment hour. Since 1844, the destinies of the entire human race are now to be settled. Revelation 14, verse seven, scripture says, fear God, respect God, bow in reverential awe and praise before God, live lives of godly obedience through his grace, give glory to him in what you eat, what you drink, and everything you do. Why? For the hour of his judgment, what does it say? Has come. We are living now in that judgment hour. Now is the time to be on our knees. Now is the time to be seeking God. Now is the time to open our hearts before God. Now is the time to say, Jesus, everything is yours. I give my life and everything I have totally, absolutely to you. Do you hear God tugging at your heart? Do you sense that not only are we facing a society with signs in the world 
famines, earthquakes, terrorist attacks, the threat of nuclear war, natural disasters on every hand, waning morality. Not only are signs taking place all around us, but something is going on in heaven. God's character is being revealed before the whole universe. You see, when Christ died on the cross, he revealed before a waiting world and a watching universe his love. There's nothing that can demonstrate God's love any more magnificent than the cross. But now in heaven, in the judgment, in the cosmic conflict between good and evil and Christ and Satan, Jesus reveals just how that love is manifest in every life. Jesus reveals how he has done everything he could to save every human being. A number of years ago, Frederick Wilhelm Herschel was a young soldier fighting in the war in Germany. There's a tremendous battle that was taking place as the Germans were beating back the invading forces. And as they were, Herschel saw the bloodshed. He listened to the sound of cannon. And this young soldier could not take it any longer. And so he deserted the army. He knew that desertion meant death. And so he fled. He fled to England and he changed his name from Frederick Wilhelm Herschel to William Herschel. Now the name William Herschel may be familiar to you. He became a brilliant scientist. And there, through his telescope, discovered a new planet. All of England was astir with this brilliant scientist who had discovered a new planet. He was summoned to the king. Now one thing that William Herschel knew that others did not know, the king's grandfather was in charge of the army that William Herschel had deserted from in Germany. And so, William Herschel is summoned before the king. He doesn't know why he's summoned. He's sitting in the room waiting to see the king and he's waiting again and again and again for time elapses, time goes by and finally a servant comes out with an envelope. And William Herschel says, the king knew that I deserted the army. The king's grandfather has told him that I was a deserter at the most critical time in battle. I know that this envelope is a statement, a declaration that I'll be executed tomorrow. His hands were trembling, knees were knocking, beads of sweat stood out on his forehead, his stomach was in knots. And then he was handed the envelope. He took the envelope and opened it. And as he did, he saw these words, the king has pardoned William Herschel. What joy flooded his soul. Our king too has pardoned us, we deserve death. But Jesus says, 1 John 2 verse one and two, my little children, these things I write to you so you may not sin. And if anyone sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We like William Herschel deserve death, but Christ himself is the propitiation. He himself is the ransom for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. We are living in the judgment hour, and Jesus reaches out to you. You and I can't pass the judgment alone. If we appear before the judgment bar of God in our own righteousness, there is no hope for us. Just condemned will be written after our names. But if we appear there in Jesus and by Jesus and through Jesus, our Savior is our judge. Our defense attorney is our judge. And Jesus has never lost a case yet. He's waiting for you to open your heart to him right now as Tim sings, the Savior is waiting.
the Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time, he has waited before, and now he is waiting again. to come in If you'll take one step toward the Savior my friend you'll find his arms open wide Receive him and all of your darkness will end in your heart he'll abide for time after time he has waited before and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open my friend, willing to open your heart's door to this Christ, willing to say, Jesus, when I look in my own heart, I only see selfishness. I only see greed. I only see the blackness of sin. I tremble at the thought of the judgment. I tremble at the thought of my sins being exposed before the universe and before God and angels who are so holy. My friend, your sins need not be exposed there. They can be covered by the blood of Christ. They can be blotted out of that record. Would you like to say, Jesus, I'm coming to you, opening my heart to you, asking you right now, to hold me in your arms, to save me in your kingdom. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you that as we study in this series, Revelation's Ancient Discoveries, we find in the book of Revelation a Christ, a Christ who covers our sins through his blood, a Christ that blots out our sins through his power, a Christ that'll represent us in eternity's courts in the final judgment. Father, just now, we surrender our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. We'll see you next time, and God bless you.